Welcome back to the channel, everyone. So in the last week plus that I've been out of the shop dealing with the recent winter weather, quite a lot of exciting developments have been happening with the 5J1113 D2 rebuild project. I've only got today to spend in the shop. Tomorrow I'm gonna to be back to dealing with snow. So let's see how much ground we can cover. First and foremost, in the track department, and this is really exciting. About a week ago, the good folks at Florin Tractor in Sacramento, California, contacted me saying, well, we think we found something that you could use. Two somethings, actually. That's right. These are the track carrier rollers, first generation style, with the correct stands that I have been looking for since I started this project. They are the ones that bolt to the inside and upper portions of the track frame channel in there just direct bolt-on installs to these first generation frames and I could not have been happier. And they also asked me to pass along another bit of information. I'm walking into things again. May of 2023, they will officially be closing for good. So if anybody needs anything in the way of parts, best to contact them well before then. But for Dana, Dennis, whole crew at Florin, I appreciate the heck out of you guys. I could not have got this far on this project without y'all. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Sin sincere thanks, really. And my favorite part about these rollers, these are the early outside flange style track rollers that you just don't ever find anywhere. Here's the breakdown of it right here. This is the 5B800 track carrier roller group and it's the 5B111 external flange roller. These are unobtainium. I've only ever seen maybe two of these and it was in pictures. I've never actually seen one in real life. The vast majority of D2 track carrier rollers are going to be these inside flange style. They were a little bit more of a refined design and the stands also had an extra like dirt deflector that went on the back here above that oil seal region, whereas these early ones did not. But this is first generation awesomeness right here. Could not have been a better match for everything first gen that I've got on this tractor right here. They were concerned about the buildup job that had been done to these roller shells. I am i don't even care, it's not even an issue for me. They did a really good job at it. And just the fact that we have these completely rare, almost extinct original early external flange rollers. I'm just over the moon with these carrier rollers. That solved so many problems for me right there. It gets better still though. They also sent another first generation oil manifold, just like the one that I had tried to repair and has now been leaking on the side of the engine. So this one looks really good, but I am gonna air pressure test it anyway before I put it on just because it gets so buried under everything else. I wanna be 100% sure that it is not gonna have any kind of a leak anywhere. So we have that bolted up to the test plate. We have the air pressure adapter with the gauge on there. Don't know if I'll get as far today as testing this or not but we've at least got another option. And one final talking point before we move on, I think it's worth mentioning. Under the last episode, there were several comments regarding the torque of the track pad bolts when I was installing them onto the links. And the spec in the D2 manual was 70 to 80 foot pounds. I did a 75 foot pound torque on the heads of the bolts and many people which would be normally correct, pointed out how instead of torquing the head of the bolt, you should be torquing the nut because you lose some torque value due to twist of the bolt, due to friction of the bolt going through multiple surfaces. Normally that's true. In Caterpillar's case with these track bolts, it's a different story. So I've got a couple of tools here and I'm going to use these D4 books because they best illustrate what I want to show. So we'll go into the D4 parts book to start with. We have this 1A665 wrench and in parentheses track shoe nut. Here is that 1A665 wrench out of that new old stock D4 toolkit. That's what holds the track shoe nut when you're working on tracks. Here's the same wrench, just an RD6 sized version. So now that we know that we're just holding the nut with a dead wrench, we go into the D4 chassis book. And in this case, tracks, it specifies bolt torque, 110 to 120 foot pounds. So you clearly hold the nut with the dead wrench and you torque the bolt with the torque wrench. And the same holds true for the D2. They just did not make a dedicated track 
shoe nut holding wrench for the D2 because well, it was a lot smaller than the others and a regular wrench would suffice. So otherwise, good point, but like I said, exception in this case. Okay, getting down to business. So this episode is mainly going to center around a rework that I decided to do to 1113's oil filter. You can see the base right here, filters and cans right there. Why are we doing an oil filter rework? Well, to condense behind the scenes episodes, I think 113 and 114, I explained how I was starting to see an oil film around this upper corner of the oil cooler. Now, back in the rebuild process, I had repaired a small leak at the bottom corner, air pressure tested it, it was fine. But the last couple times I've ran it, I'm seeing more and more of a film up here. So instead of trying to repair an oil cooler yet again, I decided the best course of action would be just to bypass it. I'm actually kind of a proponent of bypassing the oil coolers on these older cats because while well, cat ink back in the day somewhat encouraged that practice after they realized that with the developments and you know engine oils, these oil coolers were deemed to be redundant, basically ineffective. And I believe that's the best way forward to just cut off any future problems we might have in this area. But the reason why I think I'm developing a leak the more I run it is a combination between the heating and cooling cycles we put on an oil cooler that had previously sat for a decade plus combined with the scrubbing action of our more modern detergent oils. It's really good at removing, you know, hardened in deposits that cannot be flushed out, you know, through any other means. And I believe that's what's happening. The more grit I actually work out of that oil cooler, the more it's exposing potentially a small leak up at the top corner. I came to that conclusion from all of this gritty paste, this gunk, you could call it, that I found accumulating on the filter strainer. It's not metallic. It's it's like it's just old deposits, um, you know, crud that may have been inside that oil cooler. You can see there's even a bunch of it down in the bottom of that can. I didn't see anything that made it up to the top paper element, so that tells me at least that bottom strainer is doing its job. But that's the only source that contamination could have come from because the oil cooler is the only piece that I couldn't thoroughly clean. Everything else that had anything to do with the oiling system had been thoroughly cleaned before I put all this back together. This was the only thing I could basically just, well, drain the old oil out and cycle some fresh oil through till it came all clean and it's about the best I could do with it. So to bypass the cooler, there was a few modifications I had to do to the filter base. First one being remove the oil cooler bypass poppet spring and cap resides right there so if you're going to plug off the oil cooler ports you want to get rid of this because this was a stopgap measure in case the oil cooler became plugged or a line got kinked it would lift this poppet off of its seat and under pressure bypass oil around it out this hole and then you could still go through the filter and then on its merry way to the engine so this is just a restrictor at this point we get rid of it so what used to enter this passage right here from the oil pump would have had to have come out this port, through the cooler, back in this port, get filtered, go onto the bearings. It is now completely unencumbered so that after we block both of those ports right there, it just comes up through here, gets filtered, goes to the bearings. And another reason why I'm confident none of this stuff got into the engine was all of that flow that comes from the cooler had to get filtered first. So happy that it all just ended up stuck right there. The next issue then was how to best block both of those ports and me being me decided I was going to do it in a manner that retained the cooler lines so externally everything's going to look fully intact like nothing's been bypassed but internally we're going to pull out the bypass how do we accomplish that well here's a cooler line we've got this 45 degree tapered fitting on there that seals against the corresponding tapered seat on the inside. You can see the seat down there in the bottom below those threads. Another seat over there. Best way I found to do that was to take a 3 8 pipe thread tap and tap pipe threads into that drilling, that opening down below that tapered seat. So that still retains enough of that old tapered seat to be able to unbypass the system return it to full functionality these lines are still going to have a perfect seal on those tapered seats but we're going to put a 3 8 pipe plug down way down in the bottom down there on each one and just plug it off inside without it looking like anything's been done at all 
the only problem I ran into was the fact that the pipe tap was so long, it began bottoming out down at the base of those passages in there before I was able to get pipe threads cut to a sufficient diameter to allow these plugs to seat all the way down in and not have the tops of them stick up above the taper seats inside those ports. So what I ended up doing was I threw a couple of them in the lathe. I left just enough material on there so that I still had a good purchase with the Allen wrench on that internal hex. And when these are installed, the flat shoulder right here is going to be flushed out perfectly with the bottom of that taper seat. And then anything else that remains will just reside right inside the end of that fitting. So we had some pretty tight tolerances in there we had to maintain, but I think we have a workable solution. Okay, walk you through the process. I've got liberal amount of sealer on those threads because we're not gonna have quite the torque thread on thread interference that I wanted to have with this chewed down plug the way it is, but started in there with the plier. Let's see if the Allen wrench clears the camera. We're awfully close here. All right, just barely bumped it with the end. Starting in well though, pardon my fingers, it's just, there's really no other way to uh, get a view down in at what I'm doing. And we don't torque them very tight because as thin as the sidewalls are around this hex drive, they could crack out. And we may want to take them back out one day, so we don't want them to crack then either. All right, as far as I'm gonna go, and with the sealer on the threads and that line fitting butted up right against them, they can't loosen up, they can't go anywhere at all. And there's one plug, two plugs. Just performing the fit up test right now. We're gonna check both ports because if my modifications created any clearance issues, I want to identify them now before this is on the side of the engine. Making sure, yep, there it went in, or the plug went in the end of the fitting. And we'll just see how everything tightens in once yeah, good right there. Should work. Okay, to reassemble, we start with the oil filter, check ball and spring, goes down in that center hole right there. I like to give everything just a little coating of oil. Next comes the freshly cleaned out lower can, center standpipe of course, goes through the disc in the bottom, holds it all on. Next, the freshly cleaned strainers, took the inner one out, cleaned them both, made sure we had no more residue on anything. And we take, all right, here's the field changeover upper can. See if I can, uh, be smooth in any way right here. Paper filter on top there, all right. Do the twist and hook onto the base, just like that. We've got one unit now. The whole cartridge goes on top, and I think I'm gonna pivot you guys up just a little bit. We're gonna be out of frame here in a minute, so. Let's see if we can't start this onto that standpipe. Yep, we're started on right now. That has to turn. I'm doing a horrible job here, somewhat like that. We'll finalize position of this top piece once we get the filter put back on the side of the engine because part of this top canister field add-on kit was this port on the top that fed that line that goes down to that early oil fill. Anyhow, I think we can see it. There's our oil filter assembly put back together. We're fully bypassed, plugged, ready to bolt back onto the engine when that time comes. Okay. Should have enough time left today to at least get the carrier rollers apart, see if I'm gonna need anything for bushings, uh, certainly get some numbers for some new grease seals, things like that. 
Start by getting this end cap off. That holds the thrust plate that retains the roller to the shaft. And time for gloves. Nasty old grease. Got to get enough of it scraped out here to expose the fold over lock and the three bolts that retain the thrust plate. These fold over locks are pretty much just a round disc with three holes and then you just fold it up between the gaps of the three bolts. All right, there we go. Got all pieces out. One stroke, so we've got three bolts. Here's that round fold over lock. Like I said, just a disc, three holes in it. You have a center hole for grease passage and then the edges get folded up around the bolts. Here's our thrust washer that retains everything to the shaft. Now after I get my fingers cleaned off, this roller should pull straight off. And I think there's some dried grease between the outer bushing and the inner bushing, so we have to drag past that stuff. There we are. So, grease seal on the back. I can still see grease channel grooves inside the bushing back there. This front bushing has this thrust flange on it. Hoping those, especially these outer ones, are good. The inner ones are just straight through. They'd be easy to replace if I had to. Get a good view of the shaft right here. A little bit of wear on the top surfaces, not bad. We do have um, quite a bite in it right there from an old oil seal, grease seal, I should say. These are in such good condition, I, I can't see where it would have come from these. Um, it probably was rebushinged and resealed at one point in time as the old bushings wore. The roller dropped and then that metal housing of the grease seal probably wore into that pretty hard. These shafts are hardened to the point where if it was allowed to run dry at some point, that it would have wore that bronze bushing right out and the shaft would have hardly noticed. So all in all, pretty happy with what I see so far. Over time, I've learned it's easier to just disassemble these old metal body seals piece by piece rather than try to pull the whole thing out. Once you get the back ring off, you can usually collapse the rest of it in onto itself to the point that it loosens up in the housing. Then peel it right out. Okay, everybody, bringing you all back just a little while later, I've got the other roller disassembled to the same state, and I ran the part numbers for the grease seals out of the manual and put them through my cross-reference and came up with three potential numbers for a modern seal. We will check availability on those probably day after tomorrow because tomorrow's Christmas. And quite a bit of really nasty grease I still need to clean out of everything before I can really check to see how the bushings are wore, get a better look at the shafts, you know, everything else like that, thrust washers. But so far, so good. Um, still happy I've got those carriers, boy. So that, I think, is going to do it for this episode. I know we're a little bit short and we didn't really, you know, bring anything to a conclusion on this one. But, um, yeah, for as busy as I'm going to get the next couple days back outside dealing with the snow and the winter weather, 
it's about the best that I can muster for now. So thanks again for watching everyone. As soon as we have anything else to report, you'll see me back again. Hope to see you all then.